I want to welcome to the studio now the former Immigration Minister, Philip Ruddock. Good to see you, Philip. Uh, Chris, always a pleasure. I've got to introduce you also as the current president of the New South Wales Liberal Party, also the current mayor of the Council of Hornsby in Sydney, which is one of the issues I want to raise with you, because you're having a go at some of the councils uh, who are rushing to declare climate emergencies, and you've asked the very reasonable question about, well, what are you going to do, rather than just to declare an emergency, what action are you going to take? Well, the Secretary-General of the United Nations said um, it's not a matter of declarations, it's a matter of action. Um, and it's interesting, one of our council officers was in a discussion with other councils that have declared emergencies and asked what were they actually doing. And they weren't doing anything more. <laughs> um, I mean, this is a classic our... case of what we would call, mm. sorry to interrupt, but this demonstrates virtue signalling, doesn't it, rather than climate action? Well, let me just say, I am strongly of the view that you should play your part. And what we've been seeking to do is to identify what we as a council can do if it's going to make a difference. So we are changing all the street lighting to those that are likely to be using less power. We are putting in solar equipment um, over all our council buildings. We are involved in a very extensive tree planting program to improve our tree canopy. We do make decisions about appropriate investments. I mean, we have consciously set out, and I brought the paper, uh, all the measures that we as a council have adopted to deal with and to play our part in relation to these matters. And people say, but you're not declaring an emergency. Well, you know, um, no, we are acting in a way which we think is responsible, affordable and appropriate. There will be people uh, involved in other councils around the country that are saying they're doing that as well. Uh, and declaring an emergency. What good do you think it could or might do by declaring an emergency? Well, I can't see that declarations make any difference. I mean, look, let's be truthful about this. I mean, part of this was um, virtue signalling by some who were saying, if we can get Hornsby Council online, um, we've got Ruddock as the president of the Liberal Party, and we'll use that for arguing against the government that they're not doing enough. Um, we don't believe that that is council's role. So there's politics, partisan politics behind Clearly. all this? Good. Well, speaking of politics, I want to get you uh, to go back to your former life as Immigration Minister and plug into your expertise there because we've had the Medivac laws come into place. The government's uh, still looking to repeal them through Parliament, but we now know what's happening after they've been implemented. A lot of people thought they might be used. In fact, the Immigration Minister, Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton, said they would be gamed. We've seen over 140 people brought into the country. Uh, a third of them actually just resist any medical treatment at all. That's supposed to be the justification for bringing them into the country. Well, I I'll let those statements rest. I don't know, um, because I'm not dealing with the issues. But what I do know is that there are some people who take the view um, that the priority in terms of who we ought to be accommodating and assisting and helping amongst the 65 million refugees around the world are those who've got the money to pay and are free enough to travel to Australia. And there are people who take the view um, that if they have sought to, they are entitled to priority. Uh, I take the view that it is very difficult. If you've got to accommodate everybody, it's 65 million. We can't do it. So you have to make a judgment who needs the help most. And so these are always difficult questions. Um, you know, people come to me and they say, Ruddick, you, you haven't got it right. Um, Christ gave you a parable, a parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, you've got to help. And I say, but Christ didn't tell us what should happen if there were a million people at the side of the road. You still have to make a judgment about where you can help most and most meaningfully. And, and in my view, when people come and want to gain the system, um, they're doing so to exclude those who have greater need. Well, indeed, and you've made a lot of those tough judgments. When you were a minister, you know how the system works. So given uh, those tough decisions, difficult decisions that you uh, jointly were responsible for, that, do you think that something like these Medivac laws could actually help to unpick those 
very successful border protection, the very successful border protection regime we've had in well, place. Let me make it very clear. The measures need to be robust to ensure that people are making decisions objectively. I would not want to deny medical help to somebody who needed it. I wouldn't. Um, people are entitled to get the most appropriate care, whether it's where they are or, if necessary, to be brought here. That, that's not a problem. But you have to have an objective way of ensuring that those who are in need are being accommodated. And to allow self-nominated medical professionals who may have a view, we'd just like to get this person out, um, I don't think that's an objective test. Um, and uh, if the government's got to look at the law again, that seems to me to be appropriate. OK, just moving on, a couple of other things I want to ask you about. Back on to uh, local councils, I suppose. Uh, the Inner West Council is in the news today because it's effectively downgrading Australia Day. It wants to shift its celebrations to another day. What are your thoughts on this? To me, it just seems so demeaning of a day that's supposed to bring us all together, yet now this council is saying we shouldn't celebrate on that day. It should be just a mere day of commemoration. Well, look, I mean, I say in citizenship ceremonies, I've been conducting one this morning, that Australia is unique. 25% of our population is overseas born. We've brought people of many cultures, different races, different religions together. It's not perfect, but I think we've done it exceedingly well. And it's because we are an inclusive country that acknowledges our first Australians. I don't want to disregard them. I feel a great deal of sensitivity for ensuring that they are included and that their needs are properly and appropriately addressed. But we have to do so in a way which brings us all together. And I don't think we bring everybody together by denying our history um, and walking away from it um, and suggesting that uh, uh, there are some who have a greater priority in relation to these matters than others. I think we have to acknowledge all and we can do so all the time, in my view. And is January the 26th the right day it's to a, do that? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a day in which, in my view, it should be done because I think it should be done every day. Yeah, right, OK. Yeah. But should it remain as the main day, the uh, national I'm, day? I'm simply saying, you know, we should celebrate our diversity every day. I uh, think I agree with you that. Of course we it, should. to do it on the 26th, which is part of uh, what happened, um, and you can acknowledge that it was difficult for our first Australians, you can acknowledge that. It is appropriate to acknowledge it. Um, but it's also appropriate to acknowledge that we are a unique country that has certain values, the rule of law, parliamentary democracy. And I suspect if it wasn't for those forebears that came at that time that brought those values here, we may not have it. Can I just uh, pin you down, though, and get you to okay. say whether or not you believe that Australia Day should remain on January the 26th? I'm, I wouldn't be changing it. Well, that's pretty clear. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, just a couple of other things I wanted to get from you. Firstly, uh, as president of the New South Wales Liberal Party, uh, yeah. there was talk of a challenge uh, against you uh, in, in recent days, but it seems to have disappeared. Are you happy about that? Look, um, I mean, I am happy to serve when I'm asked, uh, and uh, the premier and prime minister have been very supportive. Uh, we've had some successful elections. Um, but uh, if you're standing for office, um, others are entitled to stand. Um, uh, those who thought that they might be able to offer something more um, have elected not to continue. And, and so I will be elected, I believe, unopposed at the meeting held on Saturday. It won't be declared on Saturday, but it'll be at the end of the month. Right. Now, just finally, in your capacity uh, as uh, Liberal President of New South Wales, you'll be at a function tomorrow night to honour outgoing MP and former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Do you like to tell us a little bit about uh, that event uh, and his career? Well, let me just say it's a sellout. Um, right. It's an extraordinarily popular event uh, within the party organisation, and people want to say to a former Prime Minister, and Tony is a former Prime Minister who served Australia with distinction, um, won an election in difficult circumstances, and I was with him during that campaign. I travelled with him. That's right, yeah. Um, and uh, had that opportunity. I've had an opportunity to work with him. Uh, we don't always agree on everything, but then I've never agreed with any of our former Prime Ministers on everything. Uh, there are always moments in which you have uh, uh, disagreement, but uh, we are a team. Um, and what I'm proud of is in the Liberal Party, uh, we acknowledge those who have given great and distinguished service and we acknowledge that from Tony Abbott. Thanks so much for joining us, Philip. Appreciate it. Pleasure.